Ever since Darwin, biologists have understood the importance of the tree of life metaphor. In Philomath, we will learn how to infer that tree and how to use it to understand biological processes. Philomath is made possible through a career grant from NSF, as well as ongoing support from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Today we're going to talk about the differences between Bayesian and frequentist inferences, because in a general way. We'll get into phylogenetics later. Okay, so here's a cartoon from XKCD. Um, Asking the sun to just explode, and we'll get a chance to read through it. Okay, and one objective for today is by the end of this, you should under, you should understand what's being talked about here and find it funny. If you haven't met both of those goals, I've done something wrong. So let's start with coin flipping. Right. So simple example, um, which we all use stats, right? That helps you understand. Of course, in biology, we have many things that are like this. You know, what's probably a speciation. Um, What's the chance rate of character change at different time, points in time? Things that are of this sort. Um, but let's do this simple example. All right, so this coin has a certain probability Q of landing heads. Uh, if it's a fair coin, Q is 0.5. If Q is 1, the coin always lands heads, and so forth. So what's a good estimate of Q for this coin? All right. And so it's a simple question, but depending on what kind of statistician you are, you have different answers. Right? A Bayesian would answer one way, a frequent would answer another way. And of course, here we're doing like these cartoon villain versions of these, right? Um, in real life, statisticians use the best, typically we use the best tool for the job, right? So if a non-parametric approach is best, she or he will use that. If a frequent approach is best, she or he will use that. We use Bayesian at times. We might use multiple approaches to test for robustness, right? So you rare, rare to find people who just use only one religiously, but I mean, they are out there. Let's first look at what the cartoon and frequentist would do. Okay, so first you need to choose a model. So in this case, we think the coin has an innate probability of landing heads. That does not depend on whether the previous coin toss was heads, whether it's sunny outside, whether it's tossed in the right or left hand, any other information like that. Right? So it's a very simple model. Um, and so for that model, binomial distribution works best. So now we have our model, we have our data. So I need to do likelihood. Okay. So Likelihood of the hypothesis given the data is proportional to the probability of the hypothesis given the, of the data given the hypothesis. So that's just the definition of likelihood. Let's unpack it a little bit. Okay. So in our case, the hypothesis is just a value for Q. Right? So I hypothesize that Q is 0.4, or 0.8, or 0.5, and the data are just getting two heads out of three tosses. Okay. And then we get the probability of those data given the hypothesis. Um, so we can you take the value of 0.4 for example, and there's plug and chug in a binomial formula, right? So probably getting two heads and one toss, given that the coin has a 0.4 chance of landing heads, is you know, Google Math 0.288. So we can say the likelihood of that hypothesis of Q equals 0.4, given the data of two heads out of three tosses, is 0.288. Right? And that's just likelihood. That's it. So we just calculate the likelihood for this coin flipping example. And so likely it takes as the best estimate of Q that Q that maximizes the probability of the observed data. All right, so the way I could do it, I could try a value of 0.5 in that formula, plug and chug. I could differentiate it and find the maximum. There's various approaches I could do to infer what that, what that best Q is. Because so here, just looking at the plot of it, right here we see a nice smooth curve. Okay, and there's our value of 0.4. Right, so 0.4 on the x-axis leads to the observed likelihood of 0.288 on the y-axis. Right, and so we can figure out where the maximum is. And in our case, it's up here. Right, and that goes down to 0.667. Right, so that's our maximum likelihood estimate of Q is 0.667. Okay. So intuitively, that makes a lot of sense. Right, we have this object when it heads two thirds of the time. So two thirds seems like a reasonable estimate of its chance of landing heads on one toss. Right, but do you really think it's two thirds? Right. So if I said, okay, I'll have a contest, you know, and I'll flip the coin another thousand times, and the person on YouTube who guesses the right number gets a prize, like, like a you know 3D tree, right? That'd be a pretty cool prize, right? Would you guess, you know, 667 times for getting heads, or would you guess something more like 500? Right. Probably most, 500, 500, given what we think of coins, is probably a better estimate. Right. So what are you doing there? Right. So I was going to think about 
when the, your innate approach differs from the statistical approach, why might we be doing that? In this case, we think we know something about how coins work. Right? It's not a random number generator on a computer spitting out H's and T's. It's actually a physical object right? that has properties that we know of, like balance and things like that. And so given what we know of coins, we expect it to be pretty close to 50-50. Right? So why not use a method that lets us put that information into the analysis? Another issue with likelihood is we get at the end, we get a value uh, with the probability of the data given the hypothesis, right? So probably getting, you know, two-thirds heads if, if Q were 0.4 is 0.288, okay? Does that mean we're confident? What if we have a Q of 0 0.4, 0 0.41, 0 0.42? Are those much worse, a little bit worse? And so there's ways to get at that, but not directly from this function, right? So a more natural result would be getting the probability of the hypothesis given the data. So you can say the probability of this being um, 0.4 is exactly x probability. Okay. And that makes a little more sense for discrete parameters, but we'll get to it. Okay, so we turn that probability of the data of the hypothesis given the data, we can use Bayes' rule. Right. And that's all Bayes' rule is. It should look a lot like conditional probability because it is. So let's unpack it a little bit. So the probability of the data given the hypothesis. So we've seen that before, that's likelihood. So that's likely as part of Bayes' rule and part of Bayesian analysis, typically. Um, probability of the hypothesis alone. So that's our prior probability of it. So right? that's saying, before I have any data, right, what do I think the probability of, the, of Q being 2 thirds is versus Q being 0.4? Right? So I put in probably a 0.4 there, probably a 2 thirds there, depending on my, what my hypothesis is. You can just multiply those together and then divide that by the same thing for all possible hypotheses, right? So I can, uh, if I have a small set of discrete hypotheses, I could add them up. If I have continuous hypotheses, I can integrate it. If I have a weirder structure, I can do MCMC to figure that out. Okay. Um, but I can really do this to get at my posterior probability, probably a hypothesis given the data. Okay. So again, this comes from conditional probability. So here's an example of conditional probability, right? So can you pick up a, can you hear the ocean if you hold a seashell? Um, and so we just work through that cartoon. Right? And then what you do is go through here and substitute data and hypothesis for um, seashell picking up in near the ocean. Okay. So what are these priors? These are your beliefs you have about the world before you see anything. Right? So I could have one prior that's a flat prior. I could say, um, I don't know anything about coins, right? And so the probability of heads on a coin could be 0 0.01 as, as equally as it could be 0.5, right? So you have this orange horizontal line for that. You often call that an uninformative prior, right? So it's not providing any information to skew us away from what the, the data are telling us, okay? I could also use an informative prior. So here I put a prior that has a lot of weight on 0.5. So I say, I know something about coins, coins are fair, Right, so I'm probably going to say, with, especially if we have just, you know, it, regardless of how many flips I have, we're going to be tending to have it on 0.5. Now, one nice thing about Bayesian the prior like this is as I add more, more data, it can move the prior. So if I have just one flip and I get, you know, one heads, I'm not going to, you know, just using likelihood, I'd say the estimate is 1 for, the, for Q. Right, with this prior, I say the estimate is now 0.5001, right? If I flip the coin a billion times and always found it heads, then I can move my prior, right? Because the posterior is the likelihood times the prior. So as the likelihood gets bigger, it matters more than the prior for most priors. I could also say, you know, I know something about coins and stats examples, they're never fair. So let me have this weird prior where I say, you know, whatever the coin is, it just can't be fair, a fair coin. It has to be very, very, very biased coin. That's that pink prior. And the likelihood function again, right? And the posterior is the likelihood times the prior divided by some of those for all of them, right? And so here we see how each of those priors relates to the posterior. Okay, so for my orange flat prior, the final curve is like, like my likelihood curve, right? And the maximum there is <coughs> at two thirds, just like it was with likelihood alone, okay? For my um, informative prior on being at 0.5, it's now moved slightly to the right of 0.5, right? because I did get two thirds heads, it's not going to be to the right and the left, right? but I'm putting a lot, of, a lot of weight on it still being near 
And finally, for the, the, the informative prior that shows the coin is not fair, I think the coin is very likely to be, you know, 0.9 heads, right? There's still some chance, though, that it's, you know, 0.1 heads. So what I can do with this also is figure out the width of these and say, you know, the posterior probability, the, the points making up 95% of the posterior probability occur within, say, 0.1 under the, of, of 0.5 under the blue prior. So I could say my credible interval goes from 0.4 to 0.6 probability of heads given their blue prior. Right. And so here this shows the same plots again. Um, upper left is the prior, to the right is the likelihood, and below is the posterior. So we use priors in Bayesian projects all the time. So we have priors on transition rates, priors on rate heterogeneity, priors on branch lengths, priors on topology, priors on false calibrations. And the controversy about using Bayesian, Bayesian approaches is about using these priors, right? Um, because for fossil calibrations, you know, I say I found this fossil um, jawbone from 60 million years ago. I think this constrains this age of this clay to be between 60 and 100 million years, or something like that. Right, so I can add calibration like that, and that's not controversial, but you want to do it well. But there are also priors on things like branch lengths, right? How long do you think it takes to go from one speciation event to the other, right? Um, in turn, and, and those priors can actually matter a lot for your results, and a lot of us don't go, go in having strong prior beliefs about this. Um, there are ways to, and some of them don't have uninformative priors. And so figuring out which prior to use um, and how, you know, how, how sensitive results are to it can matter. And again, the hope is that with lots of data, then your priors sort of don't matter as much, but they could still matter a lot. Okay. And so just comparing those two approaches, so frequentist just requires the data. No assertions about prior belief, right? Um, it returns a probability of the data given the hypothesis, which gives us that point estimate. Um, there are other things you can do to assess uncertainty. So you can look at the curvature at the likelihood surface. You can um, do various bootstrapping approaches. Uh, there are various tests you can do but it doesn't directly come out of this method. All right, Bayesian approaches, you can use prior information, right? which is great if you have information you believe um, and want to use it. It's less good if there's priors that are uncertain and that you can't have informative ones for. It also could be an issue if your priors are from my priors. Right? So I could say, um, given my prior of where that age should be, I get a very, very different distribution of, you know, this biogeographic bio geographic hypothesis just because of my prior information, even though we have the same data. Right? Um, and Bayesian approaches return the probability of the hypothesis given the data. So we can directly assess the confidence, right? So we can say, this region of perimeter values contains 95% of my, of my posterior probability, right? Um, but it just takes, it takes the data as given. If we want to look at uncertainty to the data, we have to do other things as well. Okay, so hopefully by this point, you've now understand enough to understand and have fun with this cartoon. Thank you.